Dr. Sledge, how are you? I'm doing very well, Jason. It's great to be back. It's, uh, it's, a, great, it's a great honor to be on your, your channel. I really appreciate the work you're doing. Oh, the honor's all mine. We talked a little bit about um, the uh, apocalyptic elements of Poimandrius. Mm -hmm. um, this time I wanted to uh, talk about uh, the Greek magical papyri. Um, so if you could just kind of go over what the PGM are, um, just briefly, like think of it as like a introduction to somebody who isn't too familiar with it. So the Greek magical papyri are a collection of about 130 different magical texts that have survived from Egypt. Um, some of them are just scraps. Some of them are actual manuals that survive. Uh, for instance, the great magical papyri PGM six uh, is currently housed in Paris. Um, that's an entire magician's manual. They carried that around and worked on it. So imagine if, if, if all the magical stuff we survived that survived from ancient Egypt was sort of put into one book, that's what it is. Uh, it's not coherent. It's not systematic. It's just a grab bag of uh, Greco Roman, Egyptian, Jewish, you name it magic. Um, and it covers a wide range of magical practices, everything from how to get your horse to win at a race to get some people to fall in love with you to using goat bile to keep insects out of your house. So it is a, an enormous range of magical texts. Um, and so, um, so things that are super useful in everyday life. Yes. I mean, I, hey, I don't want insects in my house. You know, if goat bile does the trick and, I, and trust me, I want my horse to win, too. So if I can you know, go to a horse bile guy and a, you know, a goat bile guy and a horse win guy, I'm going to go to that guy. So. Uh, it also contains some ritual texts like the Mithras liturgy, the uh, so-called bornless or headless liturgy also is, is preserved in the text. So it's a kind of compendium of magical texts that have survived. Now, what's important to know about the Greek magical papyri is that we invented them, right? No ancient Egyptian, Greek, Roman person ever put them together that way. We collected them that way. And I think what's really great about a really great example of that is, for instance, all of the magical texts attributed to Christians are in a totally other volume, right? Right, those um, Coptic uh, right, texts Cop by Coptic Meyer. Texts of power. By Meyer, yeah. Yeah, by Meyer. And so that is important, right? Because it's somehow, you know, we, we separate them off as if they're different, but they're not different. So we're talking about texts that survive from the uh, from the period of roughly Roman-occupied Roman, Roman -occupied, uh, Egypt up till um you know eight ninth century of, of the common era so that's roughly what they are they're preserved in greek they're preserved in aramaic they're preserved in uh, demotic um and coptic obviously um so that's what we have in the uh, greek magical papyri so uh, some of the neat ones are actually preserved bilingually there'll be a coptic version and a, a greek version right next to each other in that way so that's what the greek magical papyri are they're um uh, they're a collection of greco um egyptian jewish roman magic from uh from the late classical world all right that makes it sound so mysterious on huh? like the term gnostic gems it's a neat collection of texts and it's really handily edited you know in the bets edition you really um brought something to mind um bets in his introduction really makes the point that uh the concept of uh magic and cult and religion um, all these artificial divides didn't exist in antiquity. This no, is just no. how people live their life. Um, right. It was probably indistinguishable um, you, magical you, uh, practices from religion. No, and not even not even a difference between religions. You know, like you have texts in this; uh, these are highly syncretistic texts, like many magical texts, where you know you would invoke. Uh, Yahweh and Toth and Jesus <laughs> and, and, you know, just kind of a grab bag of gods. And, you know, the idea was, you know, uh, you, you don't, you, you, you don't, the, what sense is in there is there to narrowing down your attempt to get things done to one God? There might be, you know, it's like the radio, you broadcast everyone, you, you get what you can get. And yeah, so uh, there's a Moses, there's a Moses magical papyri. No, there is. Yeah. There's a Moses one. So yeah, the idea, right. Is that these texts uh, really invoke a wide range of gods. And I think that what's really cool about them is they tell us a lot more about what average people were up to because, you know, the religious authorities will tell you, no, you should only believe in blah, 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 blah. Um, but the average person on the street, yeah, they went to the synagogue or to the temples or and they prayed. And, and if, if their prayers didn't get answered, I can guarantee you, 
their next stop was the amulet maker, the spell worker, the ritual expert. And that's still true. I think one of my favorite um, modern day religions is uh, religion, uh, you know, just for lack of a better term, is Santeria. Mm -hmm. Santeria really reminds me of uh, all, I, I think Paul would really be, <laughs> I think if he would put it, was put in a time machine, he would kind of nope out of Christianity and he would just become like a Santeria <laughs> pre high priest or something very easily. This discussion uh, really reminds me of a um, conversation I was having with Dr. Litwa uh, the other night. Um, you know, we were talking about dream divination, the um, mm -hmm. the religious specialist, the Anyarapolos Anyer um, dream interpreter. Um, they had specific clientele. And one thing I really liked about uh, the PGM going through it was all these different, uh, like you were saying, vast array of spells. Like some of my favorites are uh, the very first one actually, where you invoke the personal personal diamond to be your like assistant. Yep. <laughs> and then I like, I like the other one I like is uh, uh, PGM one, two, two, two through two, three, one, the invisibility spell. Yep. Um, you know, yeah, speaking of invisibility spells. You can't, I'm like Drax right now, you can't see. Can we glean about the hopes and fears of, you know, these, this clientele from looking at these uh, texts like this. They're us. They're the same things we're, they're us. They're, they're the same kinds of things that we hope and fear about. We want people to love us. We want, uh, we want a horse to win. We want to win the Powerball. We want to, we want to, you know, have powers that we shouldn't or don't deserve. Um, at the end of the day, I think what the PGM reveals to us is that it's always the great things about the past that really are incredible is when we realize that people in the past are us, they're just normal people. And yeah, we want them. We want people to love us. We want, we want an assistant. They're like who wants, who wants to spend all their time on email or, you know, on zoom calls. If you could summon your personal diamond to be on zoom calls for you, of course you would do that. <laughs> and so yeah, I'd, re I'd replace me with a, a diamond. Of course I would love to have a diamond <laughs> to like, you know, answer my emails or, you know, edit my, uh, my YouTube videos. So it's just, it's just this kind of things that people cared about. And so what we see in the Greek magical papyri are at some level religion on the street. This is street level religion. Uh, and that's true of the Divixiones of the Roman period and, and of the, of, you know, Roman magic and things like that. It's not the high and mighty giving us a highly redacted, highly edited, you know, Torah version of, of what's supposed to be. It's, this is what survived. And this is a pretty consistent of what we've, think people really were about in terms of their hopes and dreams and fears and desires. So in that way, I think the PGM is a better glimpse into the world of Eastern Mediterranean religious devotion than, you know, Philo or the new Testament or uh, the Mishnah or whatever, because those are incredible elites. Those are the, that's 1% of the 1% talking to each other. Um, this is, you know, and I love some of the Greek magical power too. They're meant to be sold. So they would copy out like six copies of the same spell and leave the space empty for the name to go in. And they just tore off the part that went to the person who like, yeah, go bury that in the graveyard or whatever. Um, yeah, that's awesome. That's like going to, uh, in Denver, there's a place called Casa Bonita where you can get your, uh, get your really bad Mexican food and watch people like dive off cliffs and stuff and get your <laughs> customized shirts. It's, I imagine it's kind of like that. So. Yeah, in that way. So I think that's why the Greek magical papyri are, are so important. Also, they preserve rituals that otherwise wouldn't survive. You know, the Mitra, the Mithras liturgy, the the Bornless uh, Headless liturgy. Uh, those texts would not survive. We would not know anything about them. So they also give us a glimpse into the doing of these kinds of magical religious practices that otherwise we would, you know, they'd be totally lost. It's a great survival. We have some in Michigan here. I've seen them in person. Uh, Michigan, oh, really? uh, at the University of Michigan, yeah, they, they have a, an amazing pathological department and uh, a, a, a chunk of them survive here. And so it is something really neat to be able to, you know, you can't lay your hands on them, but you can, I can lay my eyes on them. Um, and I have, my eyes on, I, I, have, I have laid my eyes on some of them and it is really neat to, to see them in person if you ever get the, get the chance. If you find yourself in Paris or, or at the University of Michigan, you can get your eyes on some of these. So they are quite impressive. I'm reading Achilles Tatius right now. And uh, in book one, uh, his slave is telling him about how the eyes are the, uh, the windows through which beauty comes to the soul. No. And we, we should, we should never forget that in the, in the, in the late classical world, there was still a debate about how, how sight worked, whether or not the eyes reached out 
or whether the light reached in. And I love the idea that that uh, you know uh, Plato was in the minority. He really believed that light reached in through the sun, but many people believe that light reached out. And I love the idea that your eyes are actually like feeling. You it's know, fascinating. Uh, <laughs> I, I love that that theory of sight. That uh, you're not seeing, but you're feeling with your eyes, uh, and that's a really. Uh, it's always struck me as a. I mean, sometimes you even talk about that, right? It's haptic sight. I always love mm -hmm. that image of like haptic texture, that like, you know, that sight has texture too, and uh, that image, that idea has always struck me as incredibly uh, beautiful and useful. Thank you so much. Um, we will definitely come back to the concept of sight in antiquity. Now, I really want to do a deep dive now. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Um, everybody go and check out Dr. Sledge's um, amazing collaboration on Neoplatonism he's doing with uh, a bunch of other uh, fantastic con content creators like Angela Puka, uh, you know, uh, Let's Talk Religion, uh, the Modern Hermeticist and others. I, I, I absolutely loved it. Uh, go Thank subscribe you. to his Patreon uh, and YouTube. Uh, until next time, Dr. Sledge, thank you for joining me and you have a great evening. Thank you so much, Jason.